and thank you for uh, all of those who have come out tonight. I am going to talk to you a, a little bit about updates, but before I talk about any updates, I'm going to start by saying a little bit of the rationale that drives a group like the Climate and Clean Air Coalition to be around in the first place. And so these are some views from the scientific advisory panel. One of the, the main rationales that brings us together is because the short-lived climate pollutants not only affect climate, but they affect public health and they affect agriculture. And that's illustrated uh, in these two charts here, where the one on the right shows a reference scenario for global mean temperature where things just keep getting worse and worse. The rise goes on and on inexorably. There are a couple different cases below that when we adopt fairly ambitious, though not the most possible, uh, aggressive possible CO2 scenarios, you can certainly slow down warming, but you can see that the effects are almost exclusively later in the century. The converse is true for measures that look at short-lived climate pollutants. Their effects are almost all happening right away. So when you look at the next several decades, you see that virtually all of the leverage for reducing the rate of, of warming comes from targeting the SLCPs. You can also see that the only way you have a chance of keeping below thresholds like 2 or 1.5 degrees is by doing both. Both of these have to be done aggressively. We've delayed dealing with CO2 enough that you can't possibly keep below these thresholds without aggressive action on both. So both are very urgent. But they're also urgent for different reasons. And the short-lived climate pollutants are urgent for bending down the curve of near-term warming. But on the left, you also see the profound effect on public health. The cumulative effect, we show climate cumulatively, so we might as well show health cumulatively as well. Implementing these short-lived climate forcing reductions uh, climate pollutant re emission reductions, rather, saves tens of millions of lives over that same period. So there's really a profound urgency for the sake of societal well-being and the sake of the citizens of the world, uh, not only for the sake of mitigating long-term climate change. The other thing that's really wonderful about short-lived climate pollutants is that all of the technologies to put these into place, everything that's included here, are things we know how to do. So what's this, the graph on the right looks only at black carbon and methane using existing control measures. We also know how to control HFCs. You put the three of those together and using the technology that we already have on the table and has been implemented somewhere in the world, if we aggressively ramp up the pace of that and make it much more widespread, that's the kind of benefits we can get millions of tons of agricultural yield, millions of lives saved, and reducing the rate of warming over the next several decades by around half. These are pretty profound benefits. Now, I've, I've called out a couple times the rate of warming over the next several decades. Why is that important? The rate of warming is already having profound impacts. Here's a paper that just came out a couple months ago in Science talking about how the rapid warming is collapsing a, a very important fishery off of the east part of the United States and Canada. So this is already having massive consequences and, and the, the global peak warming is certainly an important thing to try to control and we have two degree or 1.5 degree targets because that's an important issue. Not, this doesn't take anything away from that but it's also important to control the rate because when warming happens too quickly feedbacks kick in and ecosystems can't respond. So these are really important things. And I just wanna, wanna highlight one example in history. Many of you probably know that the largest volcanic eruption in the past many centuries was Tambora. 1815, an enormous volcano went off. If you look at the effects of that, they were pretty modest in terms of global mean annual average temperature. It wasn't that big of a deal. But it wasn't driven by CO2, it was driven by aerosols, which reflected sunlight back to space during the summer when we grow our food in the Northern Hemisphere. And so by having colder temperatures, by having less sunlight for photosynthesis, we had massive famines across much of Europe, North America, and Asia. Right? So there are very profound effects when you're dealing with non-CO2 forcers that are not related to total global mean a annual average temperature. And that's really the rationale for CCAC to complement efforts to, to control long-term peak warming. And so some of those uh, additional impacts that we have from, from the short-lived climate pollutants are things like a lot of new research. This is the update part. Uh, new research has really coalesced 
kind of to kind of exemplify how aerosols, in particular dark aerosols, absorb heat into the atmosphere and therefore alter weather patterns. So they can shift the timing and intensity of the monsoon. They can cause local flooding. There's a lot of damages they do, which are not proportional at all to global mean temperature changes. Another thing that I think is, is an interesting update is that the health community has become far more aware of what's going on in terms of, of air pollution. And so the World Health Organization has been doing a lot in this, was part of CCAC. This, these are some quotes from a recent uh, study commissioned by The Lancet, which is probably the leading medical journal in the whole world. And they talk about how, how addressing climate change could be the greatest global health opportunity of this century and they recommend, so the medical community, not the physical scientists here, but the medical community is recommending to reduce the health burden of particulate matter and short-lived climate pollutants. So I think we've really got a great partner in the medical community around the world. I just wanted to show one more update here. This is a really, uh, I think, very hopeful thing, a new result that just came out this week, in fact, of uh, hopeful for the COP and that this shows that for the first time, carbon dioxide emission growth rates have slowed without having a global economic recession. So this is really great optimistic. That's that point up in the upper right. It's slightly lower than the, than the year before, and that hasn't happened before without a recession. If you look at the details, I mean, while this is still good news, if you look at the details, this is almost all coming from slowdowns in China and secondarily in the United States. And both of those are driven by shifting from coal power to natural gas power. So when you see a chart like this, which only shows carbon dioxide, what's being left out here is the methane that can come out of natural gas extraction, storage, transport, and, uh, and leakage along the way in, in, in the power generation process. So this emphasizes one of the key initiatives of CCAC, which is really to target and control the release of fugitive methane, especially from the oil and gas industry, and that's fantastically important. In order for this CO2 change to be good news, we need the total effect to be incorporated. So one of the great things about the Paris communique, in my opinion, was this emphasis on proper accounting of things like methane. We know methane behaves like a greenhouse gas, like CO2, but it also damages agriculture. It damages public health, and I'm, I'm happy the CCAC is committed to working towards proper accounting for that. The very last thing I want to show you is another new result, which is where science is really providing some really, I think, important and impressive guidance. A study out of a research group in Norway where they looked at impacts of individual types of emissions it, uh, from different regions and different source activities. And so those black dots give you the net, and I've highlighted a few of the key results there that if you look at emissions from Russia, flaring is the most important source. If you look at Europe, it's transportation. So you have different things that you should target depending on where you are. And kind of counterintuitively, the single biggest effect on the Arctic comes from household fuel burning in Asia, not even close to the Arctic. Right? So you, the science is really telling you that if you look in detail at which activities impact the factor you're trying to control, be it public health, near-term warming in a particular region, agriculture, you can figure out which is the optimal, uh, the optimal policy to put in place. And you can, you can do cost-benefit analyses of these kind of things. Controls on household burning in Asia, for example, would have enormous public health benefits in Asia, and they would slow Arctic warming. And so if you do cost-benefit analysis, like almost all of the CCA activities, you find that the benefits dramatically outweigh the cost. So I think that the science is helping to advance to uh, the policymakers. We are happy to keep in touch with you on the panel uh, to answer any questions you may have, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the session. Thank you. Okay. question to do Shindel on this. If you could please introduce yourself before you pose the question. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. Thank you. My name is Diana Uge Forzat. Sorry, my voice, I have a sore throat. Uh, I'm from the Central European University in Budapest, but I'm also the vice chair of working group three in the IPCC Intergovernment of Annual Climate Change. And the last time, I'm so, I, apologies for my ignorance, I'm not an expert in, um, in uh, these, but last time we have been discussing heavily, for example, black carbon. Uh, 
a lot of my colleagues said that the jury is still out there, whether the total forcing effect is positive or negative. Can you just perhaps inform us a little bit about the latest science on this? Right. Thank you. That, that, that's a good question. That comes up a lot. Can you hear me? Yeah? Yes. Okay. Um, so it's always important to look at the net effect of an emission source, and almost there's almost no sources that only emit black carbon. So it, it becomes very challenging, not only because we have to quantify what black carbon does to climate, but what all of the other pollutants that come out. So I think the jury is is probably, it depends on the source is what I'm getting at, and for something like diesel, which has a very high amount of black carbon relative to other pollutants, I think the estimates are pretty, pretty certain uh, from all the groups around the world that diesel is contributing to warming climate. When it gets to something like solid biofuel, like the results I was showing for Asia, uh, I think that most probably there's, you know, the probability distribution is much more on the warming side than the cooling side. You, ca you can occasionally get models that do not show that. A lot of times those models also don't agree well with observational constraints, so it can be tricky to figure out what they're doing. Um, there is a possibility, and, and that's been true in all of the work we've, we've done looking at black carbon, you know, there, there are uncertainty ranges that go down to quite low levels. Uh, but that's one of the reasons that I think it's really important to keep in mind that if we take action to reduce BC rich sources, we will have climate benefits in addition to those that come from global warming. So in a worst case, you know, most likely we'll get a global benefit. In a worst case scenario where that's quite small in the net, we still get a large regional climate benefit. And then there's an enormous public health benefit. So from an overall point of view of societal well-being, being, I think there's a really strong motivation to tackle BC, uh, as well as tackling things like HFCs, which have no public health impact, but there you have extremely certain climate benefits. So you have a different range of probabilities for the different impacts across these pollutants. The basket in particular is guaranteed to give you very strong benefits for both climate change and public health. So with this, I would like to thank Professor uh, Drew Schindel and also for the question. Thank you very much.